like to start the talk with a little bit of drama. Um, so I'd like to tell you today uh, about our work on an approach we call ribosome profiling. And what I hope to convince you of is that it's an approach for looking at translation in vivo that's both a powerful OMIX tool for broadly looking at what protein synthesis proteins are being synthesized in the cell. And really, from my point of view, equally if not more important, it's a high precision uh, tool for looking at the mechanism of protein synthesis in an in vivo setting. Uh, so uh, so why, are we, why are we interested in looking at protein synthesis? I mean, do we, does the world really need another omics data set? After all, uh, with the sort of advent of next-gen sequencing, we've been flooded with huge amounts of, of data. And uh, I would argue, despite this plethora of data and the, the need to sort of wade through it, that we're mi without being able to look directly at what proteins are being made and how they're being made, we're missing a critical, essential uh, piece of information uh, in trying to understand how uh, genes are expressed and uh, cells work. And to, for the sort of simple reason for this is that uh, for the vast majority of cases, or for the large majority of cases at least, uh, genes are acting through the proteins that they make. Proteins are the link to the physical world that carry out all the different jobs that a cell has to do, from uh, absorbing light de and detecting light to moving your muscles. And, um, and the exact thing that makes uh, proteins so I'm at heart of protein biochemistry, interesting, is that they uh, each have their own personality, their own physical pro properties, also makes them much harder to study. And although there's been remarkable advances in uh, proteomic approaches, especially driven by uh, mass spectrometry approaches, it's still dramatically harder to follow uh, the activity and levels and identity of proteins than it is to follow uh, nucleic acids, which, because of their informational nature, their ability to be replicated uh, and because of next generation sequencing, we have uh, an extraordinary ability to follow. So at essence, what ribosome profiling is, is using, taking advantage of the link that the ribosome gives between a protein and the message uh, that's encoding it to allow us to follow synthesis of proteins, uh, wh what I would argue we most care about, uh, with a, a readout that's nucleic acid based. And the trick here is an old observation, uh, originally from Joan Stites and uh, elaborated on in a more elegant way by Sandra Wollen when she was a postdoc in Peter Walter's lab, which is that a ribosome will protect about 30 nucleotides of a message uh, from nuclease digestion. So if one freezes translation inside a cell, and then breaks open the cell, nuclease digests, spins down the ribosomes, extract these 30 MERS, these protected RNA fragments, and uh, determine the, R the sequence of those fragments, you get a exact uh, information on what amino acid was being synthesized by the ribosome at that time. And what's changed, of course, in the last 40 or so years is our ability to sequence these small fragments of RNA has increased dramatically. So now we can routinely get hundreds of millions or even billions of these uh, ribosome-protected fragments. And that's, of course, a large number, but it's really a large number relative to the problem because even in a complex genome like yours or mine, there's only about uh, 15 million uh, different places, 15 million different codons uh, within uh, the coding sequences. So when we can start to get hundreds of millions or billions of reads, we can overcount and uh, build up histograms of uh, not only what parts of the genome are being decoded into proteins, but how much... Uh, time the ribosome is spending at each of these potential positions. And from this, and, and as I'll show you uh, using other sorts of tricks, we can get really quite precise kinetic information about protein synthesis. At the simplest level, uh, a ribosome profiling experiment can be used as an expression tool, essentially analogous to mRNA abundance measurements, but instead of measuring levels of mRNA, we're measuring uh, uh, rates at which proteins encoded by those m mRNAs are being synthesized. And the idea behind this is that if we have two messages, say, that happen to be at similar levels in the, in the cell, cell, but one, one is being translated, translated robustly and the other translated poorly, 
you get a proportional increase in the density of ribosome from the one in which translation is occurring more. And then this would then lead to a proportional increase in the number of ribosome uh, protected footprints. So if one then uh, counts all of it and determines the density of ribosome protected footprints for each of the messages, it, it's going to be a readout on the rate at which proteins are going to be made. In, in a few slides, I'm going to revisit this with a little more depth. Uh, but for now, uh, take my word for on that. On that. And uh, what I show you here is, in, in this case, E. coli, but we've done this now in a wide variety of organisms from uh, essentially all the model organisms from E. coli to, uh, to human, uh, where each of these is a gene and the measure of the uh, uh, rate from ribosome profiling at which the protein encoded by that gene is being produced. And here's uh, two biological replicates. And what you see is there's very high precision, uh, you know, sort of, and also that there's about five orders of magnitude in differences in rates uh, at which proteins are being made. And really, the bottom line of this slide is that we can now, uh, instead of measuring mRNA levels, we can measure rates of protein synthesis with a speed, precision, accuracy, cost, depth, that rivals the best mRNA abundance measurements, either by RNA-seq or by uh, microarray-based approaches. And the next question then, of course, is, all right, are we actually getting additional information, or is this just a fancy way of measuring gene expression that we could have gotten by just measuring mRNA? And here uh, is where I, I like E. coli as an example, because like most prokaryotes, uh, m many genes are polycystronic, so they, they have uh, uh, they sh uh, two pro or open reading frames will share the same message, uh, but encode for two different proteins. So we now can ask how often, uh, how well does the level of uh, protein being produced by gene A and gene B correlate with each other when they're on the same message? And of course, by definition, and, and in practice, if we measured an mRNA level, we would say that gene A and gene B had to be expressed at the same level. So if we're, uh, what, what we see is, although there is a strong, there's a substantial correlation between the level of expression of gene A and gene B if they're on the same message, uh, it really only captures a small fraction of all the variants. So there's a, a great deal of information on uh, how proteins are being expressed, how much proteins are being produced, that's simply invisible to an mRNA abundance measurement, no matter how uh, accurately done and how carefully it's measured. Uh, but that said, I'm, I'm often uh, asked the question of <clears throat> how much is translational control, so control at the level of protein synthesis, uh, driving gene regulation versus how much is transcriptional role playing a role. And I, it's <clears throat> a question that um, I, I, I think is sort of poorly formulated in the sense that the answers are both critical. We have clearly biological examples where many where it's, everything is driven by transcription, others where there's no transcriptional changes uh, and things are driven by translational control. But I, I like this next example, and this one, <coughs> sorry, I'm going to jump around from different organisms. Um, this one's actually from yeast, and it was a, a beautiful study by a postdoc in my lab, uh, Gloria Brar, uh, who's an expert in meiosis biology and did very careful expression analysis through the meiotic program. <coughs> and I like this example, but, uh, because I think it really illustrates how transcriptional and translational control are layered on top of each other to allow precise expression uh, of proteins at the right time. It's also a really nice example because the two genes happen to be right next to each other, so you can visualize it uh, uh, nicely. So what we're seeing here are two, uh, a part of the genome for two genes, SPS1 and SPS2. Uh, <clears throat> and in this case, uh, levels of the mRNA as a, from an RNA-seq experiment as the cells undergo uh, the meiotic transition from a diploid uh, to uh, four haploid cells. And you see that they, both genes turn on at exactly the same time, and that's because they're both driven by the same transcription factor, NTD80, which is a key regulator of transcription in meiosis. So if you were to look at the level of expression uh, at mRNA level, you would say that these genes have precisely the same control and they're turned on at, at a very well-defined uh, point in, uh, in the meiotic program. Now, though, when we look at the ribosome footprint, so, which is the measure of what proteins are being produced, we see in SPS2, exactly at the time the mRNA is made, the protein is produced. Whereas in SPS1, 
there's a strong delay that shuts down translation of the message. So even though the message is accumulating, the protein isn't produced. And the protein is only made later in meiosis, which corresponds to its role uh, of this SPS1 in this late stage in meiosis. So it's uh, <coughs> this layering of the transcription and the translational control that allows uh, precise ex expression of proteins, the right protein at the right time. And, and this is a theme that's come up again and again, whether it's bacteria, yeast, or, or human. And I, I think illustrates how uh, L ribosome profiling together with mRNA abundance measurements can give us a, a very rich quantitative information about how, uh, how genes are expressed. So all of that, though, has been looking, getting a, a scalar, a single number for each gene. But of course, intrinsically, uh, from a profiling experiment, you get position-specific information, and, and that's really part of the, the beauty of it. And what this lets us do is ask uh, a more detailed, more in-depth questions, including what actual parts of messages are being translated into polypeptides. And sort of schematically, one would imagine that there's a a single open reading frame, let's say, starts with an AUG and stops with a stop, um, <clears throat> that although the RNA fragments would cover the entire message, the ribosome footprints would only begin once translation starts, and they would drop off abruptly when translation stops. And so from this, uh, we can map exactly what regions of the message or the genome are being, are being uh, translated to produce polypeptides and in a sense do a very comprehensive uh, proteomic analysis of what is the protein coding potential uh, of any organism or, or uh, of any organism or cell. And I, I'll give you another example that I, I like that illustrates this. This is actually uh, from human fibroblast cells infected with the cytomegalovirus. And you can see that there are two annotated open reading frames, one going this way and the other going this way. Uh, this one's not translated. You see no footprints. It's either not really an open reading frame or it's just not being made at this time point. This one does exactly what you'd expect. The footprints start at the start and stop at the stop. But the surprise is right in the middle here uh, where there was no annotations, despite the fact we've had this genome for 20 years, uh, is really where uh, most of the translation action is occurring. When we blow up and we see why was this missed, you see it doesn't start at the canonical AUG. It starts in a non-canonical translation start at CUG, so-called near cognate uh, translation initiation. It's been well appreciated that ribosomes don't always start at AUGs. It's just our understanding of when and, and where these non -cog near cognate translation starts uh, have been used uh, has been completely anecdotal uh, until recently. Then the other reason it was missed is that this ORF is only about 24 amino acids long. So even though it's uh, quite highly conserved uh, among the cytomegaloviruses, it, it's uh, too short to uh, have been uh, identified by many of the existing annotation uh, uh, procedures. So now we have the peptide, and of course we're left with the challenge of what is it actually doing biologically, uh, but that's really the next step. Now, I'm going to get back to this how do we go from footprint density to actual rates of translation? And if you were uh, listening carefully, uh, you might have been thinking how there's a basic assumption just because you have ribosome footprints on a message, doesn't, a lot of ribosome footprints on a message, doesn't mean you're actually producing a lot of protein. After all, uh, you can, as I uh, experienced driving down from San Francisco this morning, um, just because there's a lot of cars on the highway doesn't mean that you're moving quickly. You, you, and when you see the ribosome footprints on, say, that ORF that I just showed you, are you looking at a highway where they're zooming by, producing lots of protein, or a traffic jam? Intrinsically, this is a kinetic question, and you have to not take snapshots, but movies in order to be able to get at this information. And we reasoned that by a thoughtful use of different inhibitors of translation, that we could start to take movies, because after all, what is a movie other than a time series of snapshots? And uh, we use two translation inhibitors. The first is called herringtonin. Herringtonin doesn't prevent the elongation of existing ribosomes, but it does very effectively uh, inhibit translation initiation uh, uh, at the start site. The second, maybe more familiar to many of you, is a drug called uh, cyclohexamide, and cyclohexamide uh, very effectively and rapidly inhibits e the elongation of all ribosomes, so it freezes them in their tracks. 
And the idea here is that we could treat with herringtonin, wait for different periods of time, and then treat with cyclohexamide. And as we increase the time of uh, the treatment with herringtonin, stopping the initiation and allowing them to run off for different periods of time, we would see the ribosomes move from where they initiated translation from the five prime to the three prime end. And you can see that quite nicely in this metagene analysis where you get ribosome density across, uh, equal density across all the messages uh, to begin with when you don't pretreat with herringtonin, but as you treat with longer and longer times, uh, you get a wave of movement from the five prime to the three prime end. We can follow the kinetics of this wave and it's about five and a half amino acids per second, which agrees very nicely uh, with what measurements that had been done uh, one gene at a time through things like radioactive pulse chase experiments. So we know that these rules that were based on a couple of messages seem to be globally true. But now we can ask, are there different rates of elongation? Are different ribosomes for different types of messages moving at different rates? Are some moving fast and some moving slow? And do we need this to uh, correct our measures of, uh, to get at how fast proteins and how much proteins are being synthesized? And, and with this, uh, Nick got a, a rather spectacular negative result. So he was hoping he would have this new level of translational regulation, this, a speed control, but in fact what he saw uh, was that for all the different classes of messages that he looked at, whether they were good codon usage or poor, whether they were highly expressed or poorly expressed, long or short, secreted or soluble, uh, within the measurement error, which was you know, sort of 10% on this, uh, you were getting this rate of five and a half amino acids per second doesn't mean that there won't be other conditions where the speed is used to control the rates at which protein, speed of ribosomes moving will be used to control the rate at which proteins are made. Uh, but at least under these conditions in the embryonic stem cells that he looked at, uh, this was not an, uh, an important means of, of regulation. Uh, so on one hand, that was a negative result. On the other hand, it was a very nice result in terms of uh, simplifying our analysis because now we really could go from the footprint density uh, to directly to a measure of how fast proteins were being made. But Nick also got uh, another uh, uh, benefit that uh, honestly was something we had not appreciated until we started looking at the data, which is it's the detail of how this drug herringtonin works. It, as I said, it stops initiation of translation, which is true, but it does it in a very specific way. It actually doesn't prevent the ADS ribosome from finding the start site. It just, once it finds it, it can't move forward. And the consequence of that is you get a buildup of ribosome density exactly at the translation uh, initiation start site. And so this is a global analysis and here's what a nice simple gene looks like where you look at the ribosome footprints and you get footprint density across the entire message, or entire open reading frame, whereas the herringtonin marks, you get a big buildup of ribosome density exactly at the start site. And from the point of view of trying to find new open reading frames, new proteins, that are being coded, this is really a godsend because now we don't have to uh, say, is this peak a start site, is this peak a start site, and try to uh, guess where within these you might have alternate starts. Instead, we have a nice marking of only those places where translation is starting. And we and, and now a, a few other groups have been starting to use this uh, to annotate uh, a variety of different genomes. And what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is uh, focus on our results uh, uh, on, on what we think is the most complete of this analysis, type of analysis on uh, the human cytomegalovirus. And this is the work of uh, another terrific uh, postdoc in the lab, uh, Noam Stern Guinnessar, who's a, a real expert, unlike me, in uh, uh, virology and in particular virology of HDMV. So we chose HDMV for a number of reasons. One is it was a, it was a big complicated DNA virus. It's actually the largest uh, human virus known. It's about 240 KBs in its uh, genome, which makes it about half the size of the smallest freestanding bacteria. Uh, and it had been, I think, well appreciated uh, that our understanding, although we've sequenced, we've had the viral genome for 20 years or so, that our understanding of what the protein coding capacity of the virus and the annotation was likely to be far from complete. Uh, HCMV is also quite interesting in its own right, both for its biology and its role in disease. Uh, it's an incredibly successful virus. It infects between 50 and 80 percent of humanity. And the reason it's so successful is because most of the time it doesn't make much trouble. So, you know, you have a virus like Ebola, has these spectacular outbreaks, but that's in the long run is not a winning strategy for a virus. HCMV strategy is to infect people 
and to spend the vast majority of time in the latent phase where it's not causing any problem. And in fact, <coughs> one could argue that the real problem with HCMB is not the 50 to 80% of the people who are infected with it, but the, actually the fraction of, of people, especially uh, women of child uh, bearing age, who aren't infected. And that's because if a woman gets a primary infection in the first trimester of uh, pregnancy, uh, it can cause, the HCMB then can cause severe uh, birth defects in, in the child. And it's actually the leading viral cause of birth defects uh, in newborns in, in the developed world. It also uh, can be quite devastating disease for people who are um, immunocompromised. Uh, in this in particular, uh, uh, when uh, the HIV epidemic uh, first began um, before the uh, co cocktail therapies came out and also in transplant recipients. Uh, so uh, for all these reasons, uh, we thought that it would be a, a great uh, sort of test bed for our ability to really uh, comprehensively look at uh, what is the coding, uh, coding potential of a, a complex genome. And uh, Noam's experiment uh, was to infect HCMB with HMB, uh, a human fibro, uh, foreskin fibroblast cells, uh, uh, and then uh, either treat with cyclaxamide or no drug samples to get uh, the density of ribosomes uh, and the rates of protein synthesis, uh, use this Harringtonin trick to mark all the translation start sites, and then uh, use a, a variety of different uh, drugs in, in different ways to make sure that the ribosomes were not stalled, et cetera. And also uh, use an mRNA measure uh, and define all the transcripts. And uh, this was mostly a standard RNA-seq approach, although she had sort of a nice trick, uh, which I can talk about later if anyone's interested, for defining the transcription start sites, which as it turned out w was quite useful. Uh, so what Noam found was just many surprising examples of translation. Uh, these included uh, short upstream open reading frames that were upstream of uh, known uh, or uh, <coughs> new ORFs uh, that we, at least in a few examples, were able to show play a regulatory role in co controlling uh, the level of translation of downstream ORFs. Uh, she saw a number of examples of anti-sense ORFs, so in a sort of model of, uh, of compactness where you would have uh, two proteins, actually in these cases uh, full-length proteins, uh, encoding on the same piece of DNA, just one was being encoded in the sense strand and the other one in the anti-sense strand. Uh, a number of examples of truncated ORFs, so you'd get both a full-length protein and half a protein, and in a few examples, really, uh, truncations that were highly suggestive of ways that would change function. So, for example, changing a DNA activator, a DNA binding protein with a transcriptional activator and cutting off the activation domain so that it could then act as a uh, transcriptional inhibitor. Uh, she found internal ORFs, uh, so uh, completely in contained within the body of the existing ORF, but just in a different open reading frame. Uh, uh, short RNAs that encoded for uh, short open reading frames, often well, very well translated. And then, as I said, uh, as I alluded to earlier, a, a number of examples where you had well translated open reading frames or proteins that were being encoded uh, by, uh, by ORFs that didn't start at AUG, but started at these near cognates uh, like CUG or UUG. And then uh, finally, there, there were a number of very well expressed RNAs that completely lacked canonical open reading frames. And uh, what Noam was able to see in, in uh, m the majority of the cases is that she was seeing uh, short, uh, multiple short translation products from these. And uh, at least in, in for this case, uh, 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 in two different of these ORFs, one 84 and the other 86 amino acids. And uh, she was, uh, we're then, uh, our net Mikowski uh, in Matthias Mann's lab, who did a comprehensive mass spec analysis of the infected cells, was able to detect the corresponding uh, peptides or proteins uh, from these short ORFs. Uh, so that uh, rather than being non-coding, uh, these clearly are producing proteins and once again, uh, now the task is to see what their function is. So just to summarize, uh, the protein coding capacity of HMD is vastly more complicated than had been appreciated. There had previously been about 165 annotated ORFs. We could confirm 140 of them, but then uh, we're able to identify uh, uh, several hundred new open reading frames. Many of these were very short and were likely not to be 
functioning as proteins, but more of a regulatory role in controlling the RNA stability, for example. Uh, uh, but then others are, were long and others were I internal ORFs that were changing uh, the structure of the protein, say truncating or extending them. And uh, so I think we now sort of, and also uh, Noam was able to tag a number of these and did uh, pull downs was able to show that they go to very specific localizations and tended to have very specific protein-protein interactions. They're in general, they're expressed at the same level and uh, as likely to be uh, conserved in different uh, uh, CMV strains. So really, uh, there's uh, at this point no reason to think that these new proteins that we're seeing being synthesized are any less important for the function of the virus than the previously annotated ones. But obviously we have a, a huge amount of work uh, to do to try to understand uh, what function of these uh, how a cell is going to encode for any protein. And this is, there's been a, a great deal of interest and in, in speculation on how this choice is used because it's clear it was uh, far from random. Uh, but uh, we thought we had a, a unique opportunity now to ask what the consequences of different ways of encoding a, a protein were. And the reason was is that we could watch as a ribosome went along a message whether it was speeding up or slowing down and at which positions it was speeding up and slowing down. In particular, if there was, say, a poor codon that was causing ribosomes to slow down, we would see an increase in density of the ribosomes there and the ribosome footprints, and then when we plotted the histogram, we would see uh, peaks of ribosome density. And in fact, we saw these peaks, so we could recapitulate known translational pausing, but we saw peaks and valleys across uh, virtually all the open reading frames. In this case, I'm li we're looking at E. coli data. And the question was, of course, what was causing these uh, places where the ribosome was slowing? And, uh, for example, was this due to rare tRNAs, as had been often speculated? And uh, the answer is that uh, although we saw pauses uh, at different types of tRNAs, they tended to have more to do with the amino acid that was being used than whether that tRNA was abundant or not. And, in fact, when we gave uh, e. coli enough uh, of all the amino acids, uh, these pauses largely, although not completely, went away. Uh, so then that left the question, what was actually causing these pauses? And to make a, a long story start, short, in a, a great detective story, Gene uh, 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 Wei Li, uh, a postdoc in my lab, uh, realized that the key uh, feature of these pauses was that the in, within the open reading frame, uh, you had sequences that resembled a so-called scheindel garnell sequence. And this is a sequence that uh, can hybridize to a part of the ribosomal RNA, the so-called anti scheindel garnell sequence. And this is used to uh, define where translation starts, but also, uh, as uh, Gene was able to show, in addition to this role in saying where translation starts, was causing ribosomes to pause. And so he could see uh, both in gram-negative and gram-positive, that there's a very strong correlation between these Shindo-Garnell-like sequences uh, in translation and uh, the pausing of the ribosomes. And very nicely, uh, he didn't see this in any of the eukaryotes and says, including Cerevisiae, because eukaryotes, unlike uh, prokaryotes, uh, don't have anti shindo garnell uh, like sequences. And then uh, finally, he was able to show uh, that this avoiding of these SD-like sequences are a major driving force in, uh, in the codon usage. So it, when you look at all the possible uh, ways of coding uh, 
uh, different genes, that those that have high affinity to anti shindogano are uniformly uh, selected against. And this is also true if you look at pairs of, uh, like, say, how Gly Gly was coded, where there's 16 different possibilities, but all the ones that have very high affinity to anti shindogano are very strongly selected against. So that this is a, a major driving force for the codon usage. It's certainly not the entire answer, but it, it's a new dimension that I, I think had, had uh, not been appreciated uh, prior to our ability to have this resolution to see uh, how proteins are synthesized. So just uh, to finish a, a few current applications of ribosome profiling, it's a, a great gene expression tool, as I've talked about. Uh, it allows us to decode uh, the proteome of even complex genomes. Uh, one can look at tissue-specific and even, even subcellular translation. Uh, you can do selective ribosome profiling to ask when uh, different chaperones or uh, cofactors are binding to nascent chains. Uh, we can look at uh, the mechanism of translational control and uh, the role of pausing in protein folding and, and targeting. And, and more broadly, I, I think this really provides a, a, a transformative tool in looking at uh, this key step in, in gene expression. With that, I'll just end by thanking the people who actually did the work. The real hero of this story is uh, Nick Angolia, who was responsible for the original pro ribosome profiling approach in yeast and uh, did all the e led all the ES cell work that I talked about. Uh, Noam led the uh, cytomegalovirus work, uh, the, the terrific collaboration with Annette Mikowski and Marco Hein in uh, Matthias Mann's lab on the mass spec that provided a, a, a a critical complement to the ribosome profiling approach, and then uh, Jean Wei Li uh, and Eugene O oh in lab um, led the ribosome, the uh, pausing studies I talked about at the end. So with that, I'll end. And thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have time for just a, a couple of, of questions. So. Uh, Thank you for a very nice talk. Early on in your talk, you mentioned in sort of a, a Carl Sagan-esque way that we could now do this for billions and billions of, of ribosomes. So that kind of begs the question, is this approach scalable so that someday we can expect to have proteome-wide profiling instead of using gene expression as a proxy for real protein? Yeah, I think, you know, essentially at this point that that's possible. So uh, the you know, the, the approach maybe should be, needs to be refined a bit so that it's more kit-like, but I think that all the issues are essentially practical, not conceptual, or, or really even cost. And actually, we've worked very closely with the folks at Epicenter and Illumina to actually develop kits so that you can, don't have to send me an email and uh, uh, get a 20-page protocol from us, but can get a kit that will let you do this in a few days. But essentially, it's the same types of manipulations that go into RNA-seq. Uh, John Leonard Lipovich, nice talk. You know, we work on the same topic. So my question is, how do we know that all of these ribosome binding events, including the ones that give rise to, you know, short multiple frame peptides, are actually meaningful? Could you please put this into the context of NMD and pioneer round of translation, please? The, how do you know, I'm sorry, what the function of them are or whether it's actually producing proteins? No. Uh, a, how do you know that these proteins are meaningful? In other words, in mammalian systems, we've got nonsense mediated decay and pioneer round of translation. So ribosomes scan stuff that happens along, and they may make some crap peptide, you know, before they fall off. So what's the, how right. do we know this stuff matters? Uh, the short answer is you don't. You want to define what's being translated, I think, for uh, both because it's, they're functional proteins, uh, because those that are made and rapidly degraded are going to be presented. Uh, actually, the more rapidly they'll be degraded, the more, th the more they will be presented. So in the case of virus, understanding which peptides are presented to the outside world uh, are a critical component of that. They play regulatory roles both in nonsense-mediated decay and, in and conversely, they can help stabilize messages uh, by keeping them on ribosomes and they can control the synthesis of downstream ORFs. And all of these are functional consequences of having uh, translation events. Clearly, the easiest way, and then the other, and, and I think we have glimpses of this, is that uh, they act as a source essentially of the protoproteins. So that if you 
are going to have new peptides and new proteins that are being made uh, that you have to first make them and then they can be selected upon. And you can see evidence of weak selection as they, uh, <coughs> as, as they get produced and then can impact the cell. That said, so conservation is clearly a critical tool in figuring out which ones are most likely to be functioning <coughs> at the protein level. <coughs> that said, there's nothing per se about a short peptide that makes it less likely to be functional. I think because you see that <coughs> uh, in uh, yeast, for example, one of the most abundantly translated proteins uh, is a 25 amino acid protein, RPL41, uh, which uh, is 17 lysines and arginines, is highly conserved, is produced by a standard, uh, a standard uh, ribosome translation event of a short open reading frame, and is an integral and a, a conserved component of the, of the ribosome. Great. Um, uh, thanks. And uh, I, I know we're out of time. Just a comment. We should reconcile riboseq and mass spec on, you know, large mammalian proteomes. The CMV work obviously has start, but working on the same samples would really be good. Like we have seven cell lines, proteogenomics, uh, you know, ENCODE we published too. So. Yeah. <laughs>